Whip out your fedora and Indiana Jones theme music, because today we're going to explore how to punch a Nazi and save ancient artifacts by putting them in museums. All right, so this is just an episode on archaeology. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less, your basement-based source for anthropological inquiry. I'm Michael Kilman, and today we're going to do a brief introduction to archaeology. So you remember from episode one that archaeology is one of the four main fields of anthropology. Archaeologists specialize in studying material culture, which just means they like to study stuff. Tangible stuff, leftover stuff, thrown away stuff. And this stuff is called artifacts. An artifact is a portable item that at some point was made and used by people. Examples of artifacts are stone tools, pottery, ritual objects, and yes, even ancient computers. Sometimes leftover stuff is not so portable though, and in that case they're called features. Features are a part of a site or landscape that cannot be easily moved. Examples are fireplace, post holes, and storage pits. By looking at features, you get an idea of what kind of structures people were building. And structures are generally buildings of some sort, like houses or palaces, temples, pyramids, or statues. So besides punching Nazis while searching for the Holy Grail, one of the most popular aspects of archaeology is the way we get stuff. Digging. Because archaeologists dig, they're able to recover information that is embedded deep within a landscape. This gives archaeology the ability to recover information from way long ago. To give you an idea of the kind of time depth that archaeologists have access to, the oldest stone tools created by hominins, our ancient ancestors, come from deposits dated to about 3.3 million years ago. And as opposed to historians who generally rely on information that was written down, which by the way does limit our time frame, archaeologists use a wide variety of evidence to reconstruct history. There is always bias in history, since those in power tend to write the story and will always make themselves look better than they probably were. And of course, archaeology isn't free from this bias, but they do try to draw on a lot of different methods and information that give history a little more context. For an archaeologist, context is everything. There are three terms to understand when archaeologists talk about context of a site. Matrix, provenience, and association. First up, matrix. A matrix is the material that surrounds the archaeological site, like sediments, gravel, or sands. In other words, what is stuff buried in? Second, provenience. Provenience is the horizontal and vertical X and Y location within the matrix. But archaeologists can't just work in two dimensions, so they need a z-axis too because the real world works in 3D. So the z-axis, or how deep something is, is established with a datum point, and this usually gives us a base level. Most of the time this datum point is broken up by centimeters, 10 of which often equates a level. So x measures the horizontal, y measures the vertical, and z measures the depth. So now we have a location, or a provenience. Next up, association. Association is what else is around the site. And for our friend Indy's sake, hopefully not snakes. But for some real examples, this could be fossils that help archaeologists figure out how old that level is. Like in Brixton Cave in England, where stone tools were found to be associated with extinct animals, which helps us to understand that the world is a hell of a lot older than 6,000 years. Similarly, in Folsom, New Mexico in 1908, a guy by the name of George Majunkin, a free slave turned cowboy and actually brilliant self-taught scholar, was out inspecting the ranch he worked on after a devastating flood and noticed some bones sticking out of the ground. He was able to recognize that the bison bones didn't look the same as modern bison. In fact, they were much larger. He tried to tell others about it, but he was largely ignored. He even dug up a few of the bones to show people, but still no one would listen. He spent the remainder of his life trying to get people interested in the site, including archaeologists from several areas. But it wasn't until 1926, four years after he died, that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science sent two archaeologists to check it out. This find radically changed our understanding of Native American history. The layer that the bones were found in were dated to about 11,000 years ago, and other sites have shown occupation for thousands of years earlier. 
Without the provenience and association, it's difficult for archaeologists to say much about an artifact. An expert might be able to identify what it is and what time frame it's coming from, but without context, they can't go much beyond that. Finding things in their original context is difficult and rare. Most things are found in a secondary context, meaning they were moved from their original spot. This can happen because of animals, floods, change in climate, or really anything that would move objects. If something is found in a primary context, like the Folsom site, that means that archaeologists are literally finding things exactly how people left them. For instance, in the 1700s, a Macaw Indian village was buried by a mudslide near Nay Bay, Washington. As time went on, the site slowly eroded away, exposing itself. Macaw Indian tribal leaders were concerned about looters, so the tribal chairman asked Washington State University to excavate the site. This led to an 11-year collaboration between archaeologists and the Macaw tribe. Among the artifacts recovered were a large cedar carving in the shape of a whale fin, decorated entirely with otter teeth as well as an immense amount of perishables such as weaving, hunting and fishing equipment, containers, and even basketry. A similar case is El Seren in El Salvador, where archaeologists have been able to find entire households preserved. A volcanic eruption in 526 CE covered the site with a thin layer of ash, preserving everything in its primary context. The entire process of how a site enters the archaeological record is called a formation process. Formation processes describe how the site was buried and what happened to it after it was buried. Another process is called the systemic process, and they describe the human behavior that created what archaeologists find. An example is the life of a tool, kind of like finding a pencil worn down to a nub. And much like humans use a pencil until it's no longer useful or lost, stone tools go through a sequence of manufacturing, using, curating, repairing, and finally discarding. The entire behavioral process must be taken into consideration when analyzing artifacts. And by the way, an archaeologist's worst enemy is bioturbators. These are evil and oppressive forces, like roots or animals that burrow into the ground and move things around on us. Graboids, the ultimate bioturbators. But really, everything in the universe is out to destroy the evidence. Despite that, Archaeologists sometimes get lucky and come across instances of amazing preservation. Several factors contribute to excellent preservation, and we talked about some already, but they also have to do with control of microbial activity in a site. Oxygen and temperature play a huge role in some of the most famous examples of preservation, and they involve places with little to no oxygen. A notable example are the bog bodies of Europe. These were so well preserved that forensic researchers were even able to tell that most of these people died of murder. I guess those ancient serial killers should have found a better place to hide the bodies. Although, it did take centuries to find them. This six foot three sucker from Ireland was tied to the bottom of the bog pool. When they recovered him, they found that he had been mutilated, decapitated, and apparently just to make sure he was extra dead, stabbed. Double tap, right? And as anyone who's ever eaten steak that they purchased weeks ago can attest, freezing temperatures are great preservers. On a September day in 1991, some German hikers walking through the Ozadal Alps came across what they thought was a murder victim. They called the authorities, of course, and since it was on the border of Austria and Italy, both countries wanted nothing to do with it. But because of its excellent preservation, researchers were able to see that the body was covered in tattoos and had recently eaten wheat, meat, plants, and plums, which were found in his colon. They also figured out that he had many health issues, like arthritis and whipworm. They named him Uzi, and he had an arrowhead lodged in his shoulder, which may have led to his death. Over 70 artifacts were recovered in association with Uzi. Those are now housed in the Museum of Archaeology in Bolzano, Italy. They include hunting equipment and clothing. One of the most interesting parts about archaeological research is that it's interdisciplinary. It takes methods and knowledge from geography, geology, chemistry, biology, environmental sciences, history, psychology, political science, and even some cultural anthropology of modern descendants, just to name a few. Remember, culture is holistic, and we have to draw on a variety of knowledge to really understand the context of these sites. But that's all for now for this episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. See you next time.